The Holy Gospel of our Savior Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this day and night, for the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to greet so many people who came out today. I was hoping for 10. <laughs> and I was thinking 70 online. But uh, uh, it's really nice that, to have real people in the pews. Today we heard very familiar words in the text, the Sermon on the Mount. The question that I like to form is, what was it like in that outdoor teaching setting? We have lots of art that I'm sure you've seen that's traditional European-looking Jesus with robes and surrounded by his new recruits, very intently listening to the words of the sermon that was being given. They must have been near a town because hundreds of people walked out from where they lived to hear this. And the words were strange. Actually, this kind of um, uh, words were new to the people. I want to imagine the setting is not just big boulders like usually you see on the art, but it's a wilderness. Historically we know that Jesus was baptized at this time. He had been led into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and nights. And then he saw Simon Peter and Andrew having no luck with their fishing and they dropped everything and followed Jesus, and then they picked others up on the way. They were refugees of sorts because they left their families quickly without anything. So for this time of reflection, we are at the mountain of the Beatitudes. I looked up the meaning of Beatitude. It's just a state of great joy and blessedness. They are the words of the school of life being given to the new recruits. Those who had given up their nets and followed Jesus wherever he was teaching and preaching. Jesus is talking about a new value system. This new way of life is to serve the downtrodden. It is honoring those that are least likely to be seen. The law of the Torah in the synagogue had not heard this, and the powers that be immediately started the beginning of the end. 
Jesus is moving beyond the strict laws of the Old Testament. And there are eight Beatitudes of great joyfulness, and I think they call for eight sermons. So I have chosen just one. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Mercy is eleos in Greek. It's derived from the word for olive oil. Olive oil was used to treat wounds. It's soothing, it's comforting, and it's healing. It speaks then to a merciful God who is all those things, a God that can soothe our wounds and comfort us, a God that can heal these wounds. We say, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, many times in our worship. Our colleagues, our hymns, the prayers of the people speak of God's mercy. We call for mercy, we call for love and compassion for those who are sick, lost, mentally ill, addicted, homeless, in pain or dying. We say, Lord, have mercy. When we use words and read words frequently like this mercy, it's easy for them to become rote, and perhaps they lose their meaning and significance for us. But when we stand at the bedside saying goodbye to a loved one, we truly ask for that mercy and blessing from God. For the personal side of mercy, I ask for the Lord's compassion and mercy today. I am sure most of you have shared what's going on in our family as someone is near the end of an illness. Our family zooms and sends texts every day about updates. This is universal. Everyone dies, but the circumstances can be very tragic. I have heard many of you talk about losing your spouse or relative, and now Father Art is coming home from his own father's funeral. It strikes me that this is a time when being in a parish of faith gives us soothing compassion. We know that our community keeps us in the merciful arms of love, and we are not alone. But mercy goes both ways. We often ask for mercy, but we also are called to offer mercy. As individuals, we make choices all the time about how we're going to offer compassion, how we're going to provide support. And this is when our personal lives reach out to our families or we reach out to our neighbors, as well as those who are poor or immigrants or perhaps homeless. And in providing that compassion, we are filled with love and compassion. I have an attraction to World War II movies and stories about the Holocaust. There is a book that I read last summer called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed, the story of Le Chabon and how goodness happened there. Just briefly, I'll tell you about this book. Since the 17th century, this town in the mountains of southern France was primarily Protestant. In a mostly Catholic nation, the entire town was vested in their boarding school and church activities. They became a haven for Jews fleeing from the Nazis. Under the leadership of two Protestant ministers, the entire town risked their lives for many years. They hid them both within the town and in the countryside, and then they would try to get them to neutral Switzerland. They were very clever in their tactics. Whenever the Nazi patrols came searching, they hid the Jews in their homes, on farms, as well as public institutions. In the school, the teacher would say, it's time to look for mushrooms. And that meant, let's go to the forest. The parishioners were sharing the little food they produced with twice the number of starving refugees. It's estimated that this town of 2,500 
saved between 3,000 and 5,000 Jews from certain death. One of the villagers recalled that as soon as the soldiers left, we would go into the forest and sing a song. When they heard that song, the Jews knew it was safe to come home out of hiding. To hear who and how they survived, you will have to read the book. It just shows when a church group decides on a mission of mercy, amazing things can happen. The practice of sheltering refugees continues today, of course, with those coming from Ukraine and many other war-torn countries. St. John's is not a French village, but I see parallels here. In 1860, this parish was in the wilderness. In the wilderness is in the name. And about 50 years in the wilderness, that little red church was pulled across the ice to this location. We can only imagine what traumas and challenges this church dealt with over the generations. But that courage and determination finds you all sitting here. You have overcome a pandemic. You are picking yourself up, and I know you will find the next merciful missional step. We all hear over and over that lay leaders are the future, and clergy will be your guide. Let us go into our wilderness open to seeing the need for mercy. Lord, guide our footsteps. Amen.